Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Greg Tarusian. Greg is the founder and head of search at Samson Rose, a boutique talent acquisition agency uh, specializing in robotics and hard deck. Greg, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming in, Greg. It's good to good to be finally doing this. I know. We've rescheduled way too many times, so I'm glad we can finally get on. Likewise. Now, you're one of my favorite people to hang out with in person. Um, happy to have you on the podcast and in the robotics industry in general. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we always have a great time together. Absolutely. Yeah, from from the time we went uh, drinking with robot bartenders in Vegas um, and <laughs> forgot half that night, if I'm being honest, for me at least. Yeah, you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it was a good night. It was really a great night. Pleasant stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Um, how did you get into talent acquisition? Um, curious to hear your backstory. Yeah, good question. Um, and probably not a unfamiliar one for anyone in the recruiting or talent acquisition space. I, in all honesty, kind of fell into it. I used to be in the music industry when I was a lot younger. I used to DJ and run events and That's clubs awesome. and all that good stuff. Yeah, it was. It was so much fun, but I was like, studying music working in music and also my own business adventure and, and avenues were in music as well and i in all honesty kind of got burnt out and then disheartened i was working with people that were a lot older than me like 15 20 years older than me in some uh, cases i was just like i don't want to be like them when i'm older <laughs> so, <laughs> i was like what else can i do when i'm working this hard and uh, i can get a better career path and my goal was really to move to the u.s I'm from London originally, born and raised. So sales came to mind and I got, I was in a sales role for like three months and my, my best friend's sister was like, oh, I'm uh, recruiting at the moment. We're looking for an entry level person. You'd be great. You know, you're good with people. And I had no idea what it was. And that kind of just opened my eyes to it. And one of my other best friends, he was in recruiting as well. And he was like, yeah, I'll get you some interviews. Don't worry about that company. So that was basically my introduction. I ended up interviewing in a bunch of places, got an entry level role and worked my way up. Um, 16 years later now, I've been on the agency side, which is what I started in. When I moved to the US, eventually I ended up going internal and I helped build and lead talent acquisition teams, being part of startups and HR teams. Um, and Samsung Rose has been running for the last five years now. That's awesome. I know I've asked you this, by the way, I think when I was on your podcast, but where did the name Samsung Rose came from? It's such a good name. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. It's it's uh, basically my middle name is Samson. I was named, my middle name's after my grandfather's name. Cool. Um, my dad's dad, who passed away when I was like 11. And then I have two daughters and both of their middle names are Rose. So I merged the two together. So it's not outwardly me or associated to me, but you know, it's sentimental and uh very personal yeah and, and just a really slick sounding brand as well thank you so that makes, appreciate it makes a lot that. of sense yeah no i appreciate the backstory that's awesome thanks yeah. so um i saw when i was perusing your linkedin before we started that you used to work for hyperloop one what was that like i did yeah um it was a an adventure a wild ride so <laughs> i joined yeah, I, you know, I, I, before that, I was working in an ad tech company called Rubicon Project. and it must have also been pretty adventurous. It was cool. It was my first internal role. I was super happy. I worked like 10 minutes, not even five minutes from where I lived, and it was great. I loved it. Um, and we were at this uh, recruiting event for the applicant tracking system that we used at the time called Greenhouse, and I met the Hyperloop team. But I had no idea what Hyperloop was. I hadn't heard of it. And when the team there, my manager at the time and my colleague were speaking, 
just answering questions and everyone was like, wow, Hyperloop, that's so cool. And they were like ex SpaceX. And I was like, I need to find out what this is about. And after that, they kept in touch. So we met, we exchanged cards and then they basically headhunted me afterwards. We're like, look, we're growing. You'd be awesome. Can you come and see the space? But I really didn't want to leave. And they were downtown and I was living on the west side of, of LA at the time. I was like, oh, let me go. I'd love to see it. So this was um, in your hometown. It was right there. Where I used to work was right in my hometown, but Hyperloop was a much further commute away. And in the sketchy area of downtown, it was arts district. So if anyone knows LA, this is like, I don't know, you'd probably be able to tell me off my LinkedIn, but like 2016 or 15, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure when it was, but uh, that area of the arts district was still being built out. Um, now, the building we used to have, like that street now has a Soho house in it, and it's very swanky and it's very <laughs> trendy. But at the time, it I'm was. I'm picturing not, like, like Skid Row, like just. It, it's literally yeah. around the corner from Skid Row. I'm okay. not joking. Sometimes I'd drive to other parts and I was like, this is insane where I'm, where I'm working. <laughs> but so I'm there in this weird. And mind you, where I used to work was like opposite YouTube's building. And Google just bought a hangar and there's like Yahoo. And to give you the opposite ends of the spectrum, it was like Silicon Beach where all the big companies were. And then I was going to sketchy area of downtown for Hyperloop One. But probably like anyone else that worked there, once you go in the office and you meet the people and you see the place, it was just your mind was blown. And that was my first introdu introduction into hardware, actually, working at Hyperloop. So I was the 61st employee. We were just like one building when I went there first to see them. And we had like a levitation chamber for test rigs and like some 3D printing and some CNC machines and stuff. But it was such a smart group of people and really cool. And then during that time, I was obviously there. We had multiple rounds of funding. Um, we were over 300 people by the time uh, the layoffs affected me, unfortunately. Um, and we had sites in Vegas. We went from like one building to, I don't know, like four or five downtown. Um, it was really cool. Fun ride. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, the closest I think for me was when I was just an intern at SpaceX in 2013. So, yeah. So, yeah. You probably worked with a bunch of people that I worked with because it was like, yeah, it was like a lot of, um, Ex SpaceX people had come over there, you know. It's Elon Musk idea, right? Was so he personally just, involved like much at that point, or he, he was? He wasn't, and he wasn't. I think he'd come to the office to tour it in the early days, but he was never really involved. So, like the backstory was, one of the co-founders, Shervin, um, who was a VC, was a good friend of Elon's. They were on a. a this is how the story goes. I could get this wrong, but they were on, I think Elon's private jet with Sean Penn or something going to Cuba to negotiate the release of <laughs> someone. So they said, and Elon told Sherman about the idea for Hyperloop. And, um, Sherman was like, I, you need to release that. You need, the world needs Hyperloop. He's like, I'm too busy with Tesla and SpaceX and the, yeah, I'll get around to it at some point. And then it was the year I think Steve jobs died. So he was always like the main speaker at Tech Current Disrupt, I think. So Elon was like the next person. So they brought him in. And and there's a clip of this online, but while he's on stage, Shervin asks a question to Elon, knowing that anything that Elon says publicly, he'll do. He's like, look, I'm a big fan. I'm obviously a friend. And you've told me about this Hyperloop idea. Can you tell everyone about it? And can you commit to releasing it, basically? So Elon shares the idea and is like, yeah, we'll release the white paper. And then that's basically what started it. So he open sourced it, released the white paper. Shervin took it to the White House, to Obama, and was like, can you have your people look at this and see if it's, it could really work? And then they said yes. And he said, could they do it for cargo, not passengers? And then they were like, oh, that's interesting. Let's look at it again. Said yeah. And then Shervin basically, that sparked everything off. He started recruiting an initial team and all that. But Elon was always aware, but not like financially or, or uh, engineering wise involved. But one of the co-founders was from SpaceX, used to be like kind of high up there with Elon at SpaceX and then helped start Hyperloop. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, that must have been a ride. Um... I do like the idea of just publicly getting Elon to commit to it. Tech. I know, right? When, 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 he, when he told us that story, I was like, wow, that is so cool. It's like you knew how to get him to commit to something. You knew how to, to get him to uh, 
um, cosign what was going. And then after that was the boring company. So there was a lot of talks about boring company helping Hyperloop because building a tube above ground is the easiest way, apparently. Makes sense. But to get that planning permission was tough, but then you're going to get to like mountains, you're going to get to other things, and then tunneling was a main part. So boring company was uh, brought brought up, and that was one of the ideas further down the line that they would collaborate on. Uh, so, what else were yeah. they doing besides Hyperloop? I only ever heard of the boring company in the context of that that marriage. They did, yeah, they. I think some of it was for um, SpaceX and Mars. They were trying to use the, the technology up there as well, and then they've obviously got the Tesla loop as well in Vegas. I didn't um, realize so that I, was that was them that did that. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Um, and what else? I'm not sure what else they were doing because I think some of it might have been just like delivery. Uh, tunnels and things like that but the u.s is such a hard place to get any large infrastructure built project done because what everyone was really excited about was like la to san francisco in 25 minutes or whatever it was going oh, to be if fake. they could actually do that that would be a, a huge promise right and then what i was most excited for was la to vegas in 20 minutes and i was like <laughs> get me some of that <laughs> um, you know for a lot of reasons yeah. but then uh, you know, you cross a different state line and it's a whole different regulatory body and everything like that. So it's just a massive headache. And there was always already the high speed rail projects I've been talking about for years. So as good as it was in theory and, and the technology and the team was unreal, man. I mean, I was working with so many different PhDs, people that worked on the Mars Rover project, people that worked in, cause no one had built Hyperloop. So we had people from automotive and aerospace and defense and robotics and you name it coming in and it was like such a dream team in a lot of ways but yeah. yeah very difficult to get it done makes a lot of sense yeah well and yeah i mean i know when i'm trying to do something difficult i mean and i'm sure when you are too like you just look to like the nearest you know place where you can find the person that kind of sort of knows yeah but nobody knows but it's like it's no, like close that. enough yeah yeah and then the concept was changing throughout the time so at first it was like oh we're going to levitate like this and then it was like levitate like that and then it was a vacuum and then it's this and that and so many and then how large the pod was or the shape so every time you're doing that like the, you've got the aerodynamic side of it and you've got like the everything was different how the the tube was manufactured and how the Oh man, there was so many different things. Because then you're thinking about like just for cargo, what that would look like, and yeah. obviously quickly to market. But then everyone's very excited by passenger. So while I was there, actually, funny thing, it changed names three times. So when I joined, it was Hyperloop Technologies, but there was another company called Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. So after a while, we rebranded to Hyperloop One, and then throughout my tenure, Virgin got involved, and then Richard Branson came in. He was on the board and we changed it to Virgin Hyperloop or Virgin Hyperloop One or something. Maybe it changed names four times, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it did all of that. And then a couple of years ago, it went back to Hyperloop One and then they're now non, no more, even erased off the internet, it looks like, which is crazy. Ah, brutal. Mm. Yeah. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Did you get to meet Richard Branson? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was he like? He's cool. I mean, fellow Brit. Um, yeah, he's a cool guy. He's super smart. He's very quirky. I mean, what you'd kind of expect at, at his age that has done so much cool stuff throughout. I don't know if you've ever read any of his books or heard about his life, but like... Not a ton. I mean, like little anecdotes here and there about, like, yeah. you know, I think him like going on a flight and drag or something. I, I heard he's, that. Yeah. yeah, he's... Uh, I mean, nothing will really surprise me with him. But like, you know, starting with a record shop and that when on a magazine when you were a kid and then going through everything that he's done, like with the airlines and what is hot air balloon. He started with event. a record shop? Like that was his first yeah. thing? And he built that yeah. into Virgin Galactic? But, yeah, Virgin Records. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, it's it's wild. Even like listen to an audio book or something on him. I listened a long time ago, so I'll get the timelines mixed up. But he had that, and I'm pretty sure it was like a, a subscription magazine or, or records or something like that. But he was really young. I mean, like 
teens, I think, um, and then built that out. We had Virgin Records in England that was massive, like, I guess you guys don't even have HMV out here, but just like a big record store in the middle of uh, the West End. And yeah, he's done so much. It's crazy. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a dude. Happy, happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was funny. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. So uh, what are some of the things you did between like there and here that got you to where you are? So, yeah, so I was there for like three years. Um, like I said, that was my first introduction to hardware. Prior to that, all of my, predominantly all of my experience had been recruiting in software or infrastructure, networking infrastructure stuff. So once you're hiring in hardware, it's really hard to go anywhere else. You know, you hire people who build physical things and you're like, that, that's real world. Now I'm, <laughs> now I'm hooked on that. And I've always been passionate about the startup world. So um, after that, but as I mentioned, I was affected by a layoff, which is pretty crazy. But I was laid off while on paternity leave for oh, my first child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brutal. Pretty, yeah, and it was like October or November, so not really the best time to find a job. But thankfully, I had a good network, and um, they put me in touch with Sweetgreen, who, uh, if people don't know, they're like a fast casual salad chain. Um, oh. Yeah, and you wouldn't that, that doesn't scream technology. So it was a director of talent acquisition for them, for their corporate team. And then I was also leading, because someone had just departed, um, to lead all the management for all of their uh, their recruiters, for all the recruiting, for the management, for all the restaurants. So that was national. So it was a much bigger team than I had before. But on the corporate side, I'd already done all of that stuff, finance, business strategy, marketing, everything. They have in-house engineering because they're very tech centric they're direct to consumer they have app they have a website but then we were also looking at robotics for food prep because that's pretty sweet cool. green yeah it's really cool so sweet green is uh, for people who don't know it, they're very big on like real food and food being like medicine for people because they well, there's so many preservatives and crap even in fruit and vegetables so they partner with um farmers and a lot of times sometimes actually bankroll them getting equipment and stuff like that but a big part of it was it's farm to table almost so you'd get like fresh kale coming in to the restaurant every single morning but prepping all of that is so time consuming and they're big on like customer service and customization of your food and stuff so it was like how can we make this still high quality still true to what we're doing but utilizing technology so we were looking at a lot of that which was cool um and the guy that we brought in who derek um he is now at Intuitive. Um, oh, wow. Intuitive Cycle. So, yeah, I had him on my podcast as well. So, he used to have a company, I think it's called L2F, um, doing food tech uh, stuff. And then we brought him in. So, it was, yeah, it was really cool. So, I just continued with technology and robotics. So, when I started my business, Samson Rose, um, when I started after Sweet Green, uh, I went back to people who tried to hire me as an uh, internal recruiter or head of recruiting because I didn't start from, I didn't go from like agency recruiting straight into my own business, which would have been great. Like I have a book of business. I know my niche. I knew all of that. So I was starting from scratch and then, uh, I reached out to people who had tried to hire me. And one of them was a robotics client, one of my first clients. And that solidified robotics as an avenue for me. And I just kind of doubled down on it and nice. carried on. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah, all, all for robotics, basically. Give yeah, me the hard stack. <laughs> it's the best. It's it's exciting. I mean, you feel like uh, like not a douche working on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, who doesn't find robotics cool or exciting? I mean, robots just are. It's kind of ingrained in our minds. What are some of the areas in robotics you're most excited about right now? <clears throat> yeah, that's a, I think that's a tough one to answer when you like, I'm interested in so many areas. Fair enough. Yeah. I don't want to make you choose favorites. No, I'm not going to choose favorites at all. But, you know, I've I've done some really cool or worked with cool companies in the ag tech space, which I think from an impact and, you know, route to market um, or route to commercialization, as I say, is like a lot quicker um, and has an impact, right, on our food, sure. our food supply, all of that. Um, 
logistics is cool but i feel like logistics is not that it's been done but it's so mature it's there's so much a million more... people attacking that problem from even more angles and so yeah i feel like it's just it's not as frontier at this point if that, that doesn't sound too douchey i hope but like no but when, then when people are like oh we're gonna put humanoids in logistics i'm like it's tough isn't it i mean it I think single use or dual use for logistics is probably what we need and like just a whole ecosystem within a warehouse or wherever it is of them and working collaboratively together as robots but putting a, a, a you know a general purpose robot in a logistics environment is probably very tough for now anyway i mean in the future definitely but yeah no, um, i mean I, I think it's predicated on like the ai working really <laughs> better than it currently does and so yeah you know, yeah exactly hopefully we'll get there i mean that's the gamble that all the humanoid companies are depending on and so right yeah it's exciting to see people working on it and stuff but you know i had um i was having a conversation with fady on my podcast for, from cybernetics and he was his big caution this is a while ago i, I don't know if his views change but I, I think it's very valid even still now but for investors coming into the robotics world and just from the, ex we've seen it, you know, with crypto and blockchain, people get excited and just throw money into it or self-driving cars, right? And that's like such a long game. Obviously, oh, we've for seen. Sure. Yeah, we've seen people you know, just yeet piles of money into self-driving the, companies. That yeah. Don't anymore. And then the companies, yeah, aren't there. Um, and his was like, look, if you don't understand robotics as an investment class or just in general, probably stay away because you most likely you get burned investing in humanoids and you don't want that to be just your only lens that you look at robotics through which is very valid right if you're not an experienced investor in the space you're like oh it's early the hype of that and we're going to throw money in and then it doesn't work out you're going to shy away from the rest of robotics when like some of them are profitable now or having an impact now and are much more real world so um, well, and that's kind of the cool thing about the logistics robots is that they are having an impact now. I mean, have yeah. you ever been inside like a FedEx facility or a UPS facility or a DHL? <laughs> like they're so automated and like, yeah. it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah, no, I haven't. But I was talking to a guy um, from DHL the other day. And I didn't realize they're like the second largest in the world, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, or is it second largest in the US for all of mail? I can't remember, but just all the technology that they use there is, is nuts. Um, but from another side, what, what really fascinates me, um, and I haven't done too much in it, is the medical surgical robotics. Oh, they're awesome. Crazy. Yeah, they're so yeah. awesome. I, um, I've worked on one. Um, yeah. that, that was one of my highlights of my career was getting to get into work on that thing so cool yeah well, a guy um he was actually one of my old clients martin bueller you know martin yeah i like that guy a lot hey, martin. yeah he's yeah hey martin hope you listen <laughs> yeah he's such a great guy awesome guy um and he's head of r d robotics for j and j now and just hearing some of the stuff i mean there's only so much that you can share but hearing like what they work on and then as i mentioned the other guy derek who i used to work with and him telling me about like intuitive and so he's like snake robots and all of that and like da vinci and it's just so it's so cool and that's another thing people don't realize like those robots are there you obviously see them in the warehouses but who goes into a warehouse and then they're going to be used on surgeries <laughs> which you probably don't want to know but you're <laughs> going to have happening. one at some point in your life like we're exactly. going to need a knee replacement or you know yeah. like a prostate exam or you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is but the robot might be doing some of that <laughs> yeah it's cool um are there any other areas i mean food tech is cool again i think more behind the scenes food tech is what's going to have a larger impact oh for sure i mean there's yeah. spectacle and then there's practical and yeah i mean kind of like what chef robotics are trying to do um is it is really interesting um another client i've been speaking to um robo chef like what they're trying to do they've got like the front of house stuff that's for sure that's good for like press and people like can go and interact with this robot and that's like know, the bartending like that. robot that we messed around with in vegas exactly just like that but then when it comes to real you know scale 
and impact and how you're going to you know affect bottom line because food is such like low margins already so how can you really increase and this is what the end user really cares about right you increase the quality the consistency and then reduce the price if you can put that in automated amazing yeah. but it's a long game because the margins are so sh are so small yeah that makes a lot of sense have you seen miso robotics at all or followed those guys? yeah yeah I've, I've, I've worked with them i've placed uh, people with them before i know the team over there pretty well oh, that's awesome yeah yeah i interviewed their uh chris their their cto uh, a little bit ago on the podcast good dude Cool. yeah they now they have like this fully automated restaurant up in pasadena cali Berg, or cali express i think it's called cali burger is the burger chain that was using them but now i don't know if it's a collaboration with cali burger but they've got one called cali express where it's just a fully autonomous uh, a fully robot um manned burger and uh fries oh, restaurant. that's fun <laughs> yeah yeah i mean again it's like not a gimmick, but if it's consistent and if, yeah. you know, it's low cost and probably low footprint, a small footprint, like. Well, if that's your showroom and, and you've got somebody that comes in that works for Jack in the Box or, you know, right. whoever, you know, and then. Yeah, you're you like, here you go. Put these systems in all their facilities, you know, like money well spent. Yeah, or stick this as a kiosk in a mall or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where you Airport. Just... What are you most excited for in robotics? Because you so, get to work with a lot of cool areas. Well, thank you. Um, so I do love agriculture. Um, I think that's a really cool field. We've not done as much there as I would like. We've done a bunch in mining and construction, which mm. is really interesting to me. Um, honestly, like the the less sexy stuff. Like I, we just delivered a robot last week that goes into a generator and tightens down fasteners from the inside of the generator that hold it together. And like that nice. for me is is just like you know the most fun thing in the world. So like, yeah, you know, I, I really like, um, you know, industrial maintenance. I think that's kind of a fun area, like not like the industrial line worker robot, but like the robot that goes in and, and services something in the field, yeah. you know, and, and does a dangerous job that a person wouldn't want to do for me. That's exciting. That's really cool. Yeah. I've talking to more companies in that space I, and I forgot construction robotics. I think that's really, really cool. Just, the it, s simple jobs like there's a few out there. I was telling you earlier I'll speak to uh, SCP of engineering at canvas and they basically just uh, blast concrete on the walls and sand it down right for humans to do that job no one likes doing it it's not consistent for a robot perfect job right and there's another one yeah. paint jet right just painting uh, like warehouses stuff that's just so repetitive and monotonous and can have big areas of variability if humans do it and also time consuming it's perfect for a robot right and who's not going to want to implement that technology um but on the industrial side like you mentioned the main sense i think that's such a cool area you know even even some of those like drone ones that are just monitoring yeah like, the industrial inspection is cool too I yeah mean, uh, sk has done work for red zone robotics which is a sewer inspection robot company like that nice. was even fun to work on, you know, just like, I mean, I'll never forget, like I'll never get it out of my nose, the smell <laughs> the first time I was in their facility and I saw this giant robot called Responder coming back from a mission and it just stunk like the worst thing you've ever smelled in your life. And probably you've Boy. never smelled anything this bad. It was disgusting, but yeah. it was a cool piece of technology. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And yeah. It, you know, People are not going to want to shy away from implementing yeah, that. Yeah, well, and got... who the fuck wants to go dive yeah. in a sewer in a scuba suit? Uh, it's exactly. human excrement, you know? Like, nobody <laughs> wants to do that job. If the robot smelled that bad, imagine what you would smell like. It, you would For smell weeks. at least as bad. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Manufacturing is also a really cool one. I know there's a huge... Yeah, for sure. ...huge emphasis on that right now, whether it's, like, additive or just, you know, even robot assembly or whatever, but... It's cool. Yeah, it's all cool stuff. I mean, even like uh, tending CNC machine tools, like we were doing at Formlogic where I used to work, like mm. that was neat, you know, just being able to load like a 200 pound chunk of aluminum into, you know, your CNC machine and then pull out the part. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's so, so many applications. And I think now we always talk about like, post COVID where people are like, Oh, we don't want to do those jobs anymore. And people are a little bit more picky, but I think it's been 
it has been gradual. That's probably an accelerator, but gradually over time, it's become harder and harder to fill some of these, you know, dangerous, the, the dirty, dull and dangerous jobs, right? And that's what I we mean, talked about. I mean, COVID sold more robots than any other current event in my right. lifetime. <laughs> so, it's so true because people are kind of like forced to uh, adopt when they weren't going to before. It's like, oh, we don't kind of need to. It was the same with like remote working tools. Everyone knew what Slack and Zoom and everything were, but no one wanted to use them <laughs> because they were in the office. And then all of a sudden overnight, everyone is like using all How many Zoom stuff. licenses can I get? <laughs> so it's, yeah, up. it's like, yeah, okay, so we're a Google shop. So everything's going to be on uh, Google Business Suite now. It's like, we've been doing this, but um, it just accelerated that. And same thing with, you know, robotics or less ways of contamination and consistency. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it's a fun time to be alive. It's, it's an awesome industry. I, I love robotics. Um, you know, there's the surgical is cool. I really like that. Um, other applications in the medical field that, you know, I'm interested and excited to be working on that. I probably shouldn't go too deep into what they are. Um, and then, um, yeah, the construction, the mining, the industrial um, would like to do more with agriculture um, and putting in kind of a concerted effort to get there. So nice. have several irons in the fire there. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what comes out of it. But, you know, I'll say right now, you know, haven't done as much in agriculture as I would like. Um, feel uniquely qualified to be really good at it. So yeah. higher yeah, SK cool. robotics if you need help yeah. with your ag robot. Definitely. Yeah. Some of the stuff you guys have worked on is super like transferable and you've got the, you're in the right place for it. I think it's a no brainer um, nice. for any of the ag tech companies out there. It's tough, you know, even from like their internal perspective to be in a position where they have all these needs and can't get them done internally. I mean, that's where you guys really shine, right? You can. Well, and you guys, I would say. Yeah, I mean, hiring the talent is, isn't the easiest thing to do internally, but especially if you're not like a known brand or anything like that. But I mean, most people know that the, the most in demand talent isn't always looking, you know, they're head down in their role, they're head down in their work. You got to snag got them from over there. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Identify them and get them in. Yeah. It's easier said than done. I'm sure. What do you want to plug on your way out? Like yeah, so people can follow me uh, or find me on LinkedIn, Greg Tarusian. Uh, the website for the business is samsonrose.com. We've got a new website coming out. should be this week, maybe next week. Uh, excited about that, yeah, some new branding. Uh, and then the, the podcast, my podcast is The Machine Minds Show. Great podcast. Uh, it's on a, thank you. Yeah, I've had Spencer on there. I need to get you back on. Um, Would love that. But yeah, that's that's on all uh, major platforms, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, and yeah, reach out if there's anything that I can ever do for you. If you need talent, if you enjoy the podcast, love to hear from people that listen to it. Uh, Greg at samsonrose.com. Thanks, Greg. Really appreciate you coming on. And uh, check out Machine Minds. Look up Samson Rose. Look up Greg on LinkedIn. I really appreciate it. This was awesome, man. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.